herald of life and death, success or failure. The unseen force that measures man's destiny, reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the eleventh hour. Truly, come in. If it's about the Coniston figures, Mr. Gifford, I think I can explain. It's about the Coniston figures? It's about the Hargraves account? The book you drew up for Snails and Vaughan? In fact, it's about your work as a whole, Foley. I'm not at all pleased by your present standard. Uh, but I... Just I, look I... at this page of entries in this ledger of yours. Well, look at it, Foley. There are a few alterations. You know that I won't tolerate this sort of work. You know what I demand from my clerks. Well, it's just that I have a great deal on my mind just at present, Mr. Gifford. I am not interested in what you may or may not have on your mind, Poulet. We're a busy organization here. Each employee is required to turn in a set amount of work. And you're not doing that. How long have you been here? Eleven years. Eleven years. Little wonder that you've never progressed beyond the account ledgers when you turn in slipshod jobs like this. This company is in a critical position, Pooley. We can't not afford incompetence. But, Mr. Gifford, if you'll just let me explain... I think it I... would be to everyone's interest to terminate your employment here, Pooley. It's obvious to me that if you stayed 50 years, you'd never manage to fit into our way of things. You... You're sacking me? It's best for all concerned. Well, I hardly see how it's best for me, Mr. Gifford. Jobs are very difficult to get these days. I've had so many worries recently, and I, I suffer from ill health. I'll have my secretary draw up some sort of letter of recommendation. I want to be fair about this. There. Now then, I have a great deal of work to get through. Good day, Pauline. But uh, I, I would... Good day. Good day, Mr. Gifford. Well? I've sacked him. It was pretty easy. He didn't even have enough backbone to argue. Nothing to it. Well, that ought to do the trick. It should be the last straw for him. <laughs> Pale as a ghost. Trembling like a leaf. Charles, you're sure there's no risk? I've told you time and time again there's none whatsoever. We're not doing anything that's against the law. And in any case, no one could possibly connect us with... with anything that might happen. Oh, sorry. I suppose it's only natural to have some doubts this time. I must be so close now. <laughs> you may have doubts, but I'll guarantee it's not your conscience that's troubling you. Look, I've got to ring off now. I'll contact you again later. There can't be very much longer to wait now. Goodbye, Vera. Goodbye, Charles. <coughs> oh, Miss Sanderson, would you come in, please? Yes, sir? Oh, Miss Sanderson, I want you to take a letter to the Cadogan Finance and Loan Company. You'll find their address somewhere in our files. Uh, the letter is to be addressed to the credit manager. Dear sir, I feel it my duty to advise you that Mr. Benjamin Pooley has been dismissed from this company. I understand that he has a considerable higher purchase account with you, and that in the past a weekly sum has been deducted from his wage to liquidate this outstanding debt. This arrangement, of course, will now be terminated. It will be necessary for him to find some alternative way of meeting his obligations. Yes, I think that'll do. Hmm. And when you have a type, take it along to Mr. Edgley for him to sign. today. Never usually see you till the dot of six. The usual? Hmm? Oh, yes, please, Mrs. Larkin. Oh, no, no. On second thoughts, uh, make it a double, would you? <laughs> My, we're letting our hair down a bit today, aren't we? 
It, uh, it would seem to be one of those days when one should let one's hair down, I feel, Mrs. Larkin. Oh, had a good day. Lady Luck smiling on you. Oh, that's really very funny, Mrs. Larkin. Very funny indeed. Lady Luck smiling on me. I'll tell you the things that happened to me today. Next to all the bills that arrived in the post this morning, there was a letter from some anonymous person. You, um, you know about my health? Well, you said it hadn't been the best for a few years. This person seemed to know all about it. Told me that I was suffering from... Well, said the most horrible things. Said I was going to die. Oh, I shouldn't take any notice of that sort of thing, Mr. Poley. But the awful thing is, I don't know whether they're telling the truth or not. I, I've never been a particularly brave person. Physical pain is something that terrifies me. Then there was the phone call again today. Someone who rings up at odd hours, either at the office or at my home, telling me that I'm going to die. I, I, I don't think I can stand much more of it. Here, I'll get you another drink. I think perhaps you need it. This'll make you feel better. No, it's on the house, Mr. Pooley. Oh, you're very kind. But that's not all that happened today. Mr. Riddell, oh, he's the shipping clerk at the office, left his valuable gold wristwatch in the washroom this morning. It turned up in my desk drawer. I, I had no idea how it got there. Perhaps I took it by mistake. I, I have so much on my mind. And then... Then just to crown everything, I, I got the sack this afternoon. Oh, Mr. Poley, I am sorry. I really am. And you spoke of Lady Luck. Mrs. Larkin, why is all this happening to me? For the last three weeks, life has been a nightmare for me. A nightmare? Not a single thing has gone right. I, I'm at the end of my tether. No, you mustn't talk like that. Can I pour you another? No, no, I, I must be getting home. I have to tell my wife about what happened at the office. Thank you, Mrs. Larkin. You're, you're very kind. Good night. Good night, Mr. Pooley. Good night. I can't go on. I really can't go on. Oh, what a mess. What an awful mess. There's no way out. It's little wonder that you've never progressed beyond the account ledgers when you turn in slipshod jobs like this. But, Mr. Gifford... You're sick, Pooley. Desperately sick. Didn't your doctor tell you that you had only a short time to live? No, that's not true. You're nothing but a rotten little thief, Pooley. No. I think it would be everyone's interest to terminate your employment here, Pooley. You die in pain. Horrible pain, and there's no cure for what you have. There's no escape. There's nothing in this world as low and despicable as a thief, Pooley. Uh, what are you trying to do? Enter the hall or something? I wonder what way you're going when you're crossing the street. I, I, I'm sorry, it, it was all my fault. Well, oh, that's the trouble with you, pedestrians. Never look where you're going. Yes, dear. Well, you're back early. Hope you don't expect the dinner to be ready. Not even on the stove yet. Oh, that's all right. You forget to stop off at the hotel. Goodness me, you are slipping, aren't you? Didn't you once tell me that even the slightest change in routine upset you? Oh, there's whiskey on your breath. Where have you been? I got the sack. What? Gifford sacked me. What for? Incompetence. Oh, that's a fine how to do... What's going to happen now? What about all the stuff on higher purchase? We owe hundreds of pounds. And how are we going to pay it off? And do you know how much we've got in the bank? Well, I'll tell you. Precisely 24 pounds. And how long is that going to keep us, may I ask? If we live carefully. Live carefully. Starve, you mean. Well, I'm not going to do that. Not on your sweet life, I'm not. And it'll take you ages to get another job. You don't have the drive. Stop you... it. For goodness sake, let me have a moment's peace. I can't stand any more. Things happening one after the other. Peace? I, I must have peace for a second. I, I have to get out. Where are you going? I don't know. I don't know. 
It'll be tonight. I'm absolutely sure. He's in an awful mess. Yes, I'm sure it'll be tonight. But I wonder how I would do it. Never mind about that. You must have given him a bad time when you fired him. Well, I made it as unpleasant as I could. Listen, you've got that solicitor's letter hidden away carefully, haven't you? Yes, of course. Right. Well, now remember, Vera, this is the critical time. From this moment on, we've got to be ultra careful. This is the culminating point, the eleventh hour of our plan. Yes, I know that. I wish to goodness we could watch where he goes, but that's too risky. Better not try and contact me until we get some... Uh, some news. Very well, then. Oh, and Vera. Yes? Let's have no thoughts of a double cross at this stage, eh? Oh, now, Charles, really. It'd be a bit pointless, wouldn't it? Good night, Vera. Good night. <laughs> Abbreviations and slogans. What do they mean to us? Well, of course, that depends. Take the flag of the United States, for example. There's a symbol that is respected throughout the world and cherished by citizens of the United States. But there's a reason for it. It stands for the power and the glory, the fairness and progress of the United States' historic tradition. The Medal of Honor is another symbol, a symbol of the highest sort, based on historic truths and traditions and won by gallant action above and beyond the call of duty. How did it all get started? Just listen to this. Before the Civil War, there were no permanent awards given to the men of the armed forces of the United States for doing their jobs. No, not even when the job was beyond the call of duty. Fighting men did what they could because it had to be done. In 1862, less than two dozen Union Army enlisted men, who became known as the Mitchell Raiders, volunteered to make a secret penetration deep into enemy territory, steal an express train right out of the Confederate camp, and run it up north, tearing up tracks, burning bridges, and cutting wires on the way in order to disrupt enemy communications. Only moments before reaching their own lines again, with a mission accomplished, the train ran out of fuel. The men tried to escape, but were captured and thrown into prison. Most of them were executed as spies. The others... Expecting the same fate made a brave and dangerous attempt to escape. Six of them were recaptured and later exchanged for Confederate prisoners. When they reported to Washington, D.C., they were awarded the first medals of honor ever given to American soldiers. In their gallant and intrepid actions to do everything possible to fight to win, and when captured, to escape and fight again, they maintained an established code of conduct for American fighting men everywhere. What the Mitchell Raiders did is symbolic of what keeps America a great nation. Now is a good time to examine your own code of conduct. Hmm. Yeah. 
If I only had some food in my stomach and a place to sleep tonight, I'd be as right as rain. They're my only immediate problems. You're very lucky. Are you all right, mister? I think you're standing here on this railway bridge looking down the plains for over an hour. Oh, Jimmy. Now I see him, I like it. You look as pale as this. Want to talk about it, eh? Oh, no, no, no. Not as crazy as it sounds. You got no idea how many people tell a tramp like me they travel to. Seems they, they get a sort of relief from opening up to a stranger. Someone they, they'll probably never see again. Troubled? Listen to this for a list of troubles. I owe hundreds of pounds. I've been accused of being a thief. I'm sick and I get anonymous phone calls about my ill health. I've lost my job because of incompetence and my marriage is a dismal failure. And there are other things. Little unpleasant things that have all mounted up over the past couple of weeks. Look, as far as I know, I never did anyone any harm in my whole life. Now, why is all this happening to me? I, I can't stand anymore. Mm. Mm, you've got your worries, haven't you? Oh, well, uh, I expect you'll get over them. Thanks for the smoke, Mr. I'm much obliged. Hope your luck changes. I really do. Uh, don't, don't go. I, I don't want to be alone. I, I want to talk all this out with someone, anyone. Don't go. Please don't go. I'm afraid to be left alone. Charles, let me in quickly. Look, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. All right, times. all right. I know I'm not supposed to come here, but the waiting was driving me mad. Now, of all times, right at the critical stage. It'd be fatal if we were seen together. We've been gone for three hours. Must have happened by now. We should have heard something. You realise that if they try and contact you, you won't be home. Now, Vera, you must get back to your flat. But supposing he doesn't do it? Oh, impossible. I've been meticulous about every single detail. The anonymous phone calls and the letter, planting Riddell's watch in his drawer at the office, everything building up nicely to the moment I sacked him. That will have been his breaking point. Now, for goodness sake, get back to your place. Oh, now what? Hello, Gifford here. Uh, Mr. Gifford, of uh, Gifford and Barnett Limited. Yes? Uh, I'm sorry to trouble you at this hour, sir. It concerns one of your employees, uh, Mr. Benjamin Pooley. There's been an accident. I see. I'm a police officer, and I'm trying to contact yes, Mrs. Pooley. As a matter of fact, we're at her home now. We took the liberty of going inside. The door wasn't locked. We were wondering if you could give us any idea of where Mrs. Pooley might be. Well, um... Well, as a matter of fact, I, I think I might be able to contact her. Uh, Pooley mentioned something about her going out this evening. Uh, about Pooley, is he... I think we'd better talk to Mrs. Pooley before we give out any information, sir. Uh, yes, 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 of course. Well, I'll do my best to contact her. Then I'll come over myself. It might be of some assistance if, if there's been, been an accident. I, uh... Well, I, I take a great interest in the welfare of my employees. See you when you arrive, sir. Charles. Yes, it's happened. Now, come on. We've got to get to your place right away. You should never have left. Oh, thank goodness it's all over. <laughs> Very kind of you to spare the time to come along, Mr. Gifford. If there's anything I can do to help... My husband, is he... I think you'd better uh... sit down for a moment, Mrs. Pooley. Oh. We've... We've put him in the bedroom. You must be brave, Mrs. Pooley. Yes. I'm afraid you're going to need courage, Mrs. Pooley. Oh. Oh. Both of you. Huh? What do you mean? I mean the game's up. What on earth are you talking about? Well, now, let me start at the beginning. A few days ago, Mr. Pooley came to us complaining of being pestered by anonymous phone calls. They were the worst possible kind, someone ringing up, playing on a hidden fear. In the case of Mr. Pooley, it was the fact that he has a mortal terror of illness. And the caller knew that he wasn't a particularly brave man. He went to the police. The anonymous caller is a dangerous person. Consequently, we go to a great deal of trouble to track them down. Various ways in which we can do it, placing the calls and so forth. The phone calls Mr. Pooley's been receiving were traced to your home, Mr. Gifford. But, but, but... This morning, Mr. Pooley received an anonymous letter. On his way to his office, he dropped it into us. It was a very clumsy sort of letter, 
wasn't too difficult to trace it to you, Mrs. Pooley. No, you're wrong. You're making a horrible mistake. Our investigations have been going on for several days now. We've had Benjamin Pooley under constant surveillance. And we've done quite a considerable amount of poking about. We came up with some startling facts. Inspector, I've no idea what you're getting at, and I should warn you. I'm the one that's going to do the warning, Mr. Gifford. For weeks now, you've been carrying out a subtle but devilishly clever scheme. You and Mrs. Pooley. All the nagging little worries that you piled onto his shoulders. Until they became too much to bear. And then, climaxing it all today. Oh, yes, clever. But not clever enough. I still don't understand what you're driving at, officer. You started the whole business off quietly. Firstly, there were the alterations you made to his account books. So that it looked as though he was making mistakes. That started him worrying about his competence. Then you, Mrs. Pooley. You started buying all sorts of knickknacks on credit, putting him deeper and deeper into debt. That made him worry about his financial position. Then there were the phone calls. Everything building, building. A pattern leading to a crisis. And you knew a man like Pooley can't cope with a crisis. He cracks, he disintegrates. What would be the purpose of this, this, this fantastic scheme you've outlined? What possible interest do you think I would have in Benjamin Pooley? What would be the reason for all this? The reason was that you and Mrs. Pooley were attempting to drive him out of his mind. Or worse. But why? Why would we want to do that? Because of a letter that was addressed to him several weeks ago. A letter which he never received. Because you open all the mail that comes to this house. Oh, no, Mrs. Pooley. I'm afraid it's no use looking towards the bookshelf there. That's where you hid it. But we've searched the place. I have that letter in my pocket now. He knows. He knows. Yes, we know. The letter was from a solicitor. It informed Benjamin Pooley of his brother's death in Venezuela. It went on to tell him that his brother had invested in oil during his lifetime and had died a comparatively wealthy man. It ended by saying that your husband was the sole benefactor. At this moment, your husband is worth over 45,000 pounds. And until half an hour ago, he didn't even know about it. Then, then surely I have no motive for wishing him harm. Except that he would be the one in control of the money... And I don't think you particularly relish sharing 45,000 pounds with him. Spoil too much of the joy of being rich. Now, you knew that if you destroyed him, the money would be yours. But you'd contemplate sharing it with a man like Mr. Gifford, if you had to recruit his help. All this is pure assumption on your part. Oh, you're making some very serious accusations, you know. I consider it a serious business. Anyway, my husband's dead now. And... Dead? Well, the, the accident. Excuse me a moment. This may come as something of a surprise to you, Mrs. Pooley. Would you come in now? Hello, Vera. You! Pooley! He's alive! You... You said there was an accident. Oh, but there was, Mr. Gifford. It was down by the railway bridge. I was watching the trains rushing underneath. I was confused, worried. Then there was a moment when I almost... But then quite suddenly I wanted to get away from that bridge. I, I couldn't have been looking where I was going when I crossed the road. So much on my mind, you know. And the car knocked me down. Oh, nothing serious, just a glancing blow, but it seemed to knock me out for a moment. And there was a tramp nearby. He took Mr. Pooley to the nearest police station. After that, I stepped in. I thought the whole business had gone far enough. And I'm afraid you're not going to be able to share any of that 45,000 pounds, Mr. Gifford. Looks as though your company is going to go broke after all. Now, if you'll just prefer charges, Mr. Pooley, I... No, I may not do that, Inspector. What? Mr. Gifford, I'll make a bargain with you. Anything. Anything. Gifford and Barnett Limited is broke. How much would it cost to get the company out of its difficulty? I, uh, well... Uh, well, 15,000 is just about do it. If I invested 15,000, what could I get for it? You... Well, uh, an executive position? No. I'd want control of the company. Complete control. But, 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 but the charges I could press against you would be of a very serious nature, Mr. Gifford. All right. All right, you get control. Good. I'd like that in writing. I... Now. And I shall draw up a check in the morning. There's paper and pen on the bureau over there. Paper and pen? This is preposterous. And what's going to happen to me? Well, I'm afraid our life together is over, Vera. 
I shall leave you, of course. This is rather irregular, Mr. Pooley. These people should be made to pay for what they've done. Oh, they'll pay all right, Inspector. You see, Vera has an insatiable appetite for money and luxury. Now, she's no longer a beautiful woman. So I don't think men are going to lavish things on her, and she could never stand being lonely. Without me, she's going to live in loneliness, and without the comfort of a share in 45,000 pounds. So I'm afraid she's got very little to look forward to. Well, well here you are. Here's that agreement, Pooley. Mr. Pooley, please. My great... Yes, of course. Sorry, Mr. Pooley. And now, Gifford, I think it would be to everyone's interest to terminate your employment with the company. What? But you, you can't do that. I think it's best for all concerned. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll say good night. I'm quite exhausted. It's been one of those days. You know? <laughs> What makes a person a hero? That's a difficult question to answer, for heroes can come from widely differing backgrounds, and there have been heroes in our armed forces who perform their acts of heroism in non-combat situations. To recognize these achievements and to do honor to her brave men, the Navy has authorized the awarding of the Navy and Marine Corps Medal. This decoration is given to anyone serving in the U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, or Naval Reserve, who distinguishes himself or herself by heroism not involving actual conflict with an enemy. Authorized in August of 1942, the Navy and Marine Corps Medal is one of our country's newer major decorations and applies to activities after December 6, 1941. It is comparable to the Army Soldiers Medal and is given in tribute to distinguish devotion Navy and Marine Corps personnel bring to their tour of duty. The Navy and Marine Corps Medal stands as a symbol of recognition from a grateful nation. Be listening for another mounting drama of action and suspense when we again bring you The Eleventh Hour. This was an Artranza production written by Don Horton and directed by Jim Bradley. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.